Thank you so much for being here today, uh, to this morning. Uh, I realized that on Thursday morning you had probably million of options where you could spend your time. So the fact that you chose to be here is very meaningful. Um, just before I start um, and dive into the topic, um, I would like to mention that uh, although I've been in the business for 10 years, uh, my background is in um, entrepreneurship, uh, finance, economics, so I was learning technology with the team and we are currently the 60 people team, mostly engineers. And it would help me to understand a little bit about your background. So if you could just raise your hand if you are like totally new to blockchain or you are like learning or... Wow, great. And um, if you could also help to uh, and raise your hand if you are uh, linked to blockchain and it's a day-to-day -day job for you or you're making a research in the field. Wonderful, thank you. So the rest is probably blockchain enthusiasts or social good uh, enthusiasts, I assume. Um, so just to start, so uh, for those of you who are new to blockchain, there is ton of information online, a uh, ton of information coming from media. Uh, there is a couple of good books out there um, that I would just refer to, uh, like Don and Alex Tapscott's uh, is my personal favorite of picturing this uh, beautiful, perfect future with blockchains and all the different applications. But um, for me, uh, during uh, this 30 minutes that we have together, 45 minutes with Q&A, um, I would like to focus on specific projects and initiatives where um, individuals and companies are coming together to actually work on specific difference making applications. And um, I will start with the ones um, that are potentially less known. And uh, in preparation to this talk, I have uh, interviewed a couple dozen blockchain specialists in addition to our own expertise just to whole like what would be an interesting topic and what would be the interesting startups and initiatives to talk about. So um, here we go. The first one uh, that I would like to talk about is uh, ACT. And ACT has been um, initiated as a platform for um, social accountability and um, in order to drive the better dialogue between state and citizens and uh, enable um, social, um, social and civic action. Um, I'll just... Blockchain technology allows the decision-making and running of any organization to be completely automated. We are at the start of a new era, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization, or DAO. ACT is a global initiative built on this technology that allows people to support causes they believe in. ACT can be accessed by anyone with a smartphone and works by allowing users to purchase votes, which can be applied to project proposals. Anyone can propose a project for funding, and these are organized by geography and cause type. When a quorum is reached, the project automatically gets funded instantly. This is called a smart contract. Here's an example of ACT working in action. Maria Zuba lives with her disabled daughter, Lena, in Minsk in Belarus. Lena is confined to a wheelchair, and recently the elevator in their apartment building stopped working. Fixing it is the responsibility of the local government, but they said they could not fix it for budgetary reasons. Local law has provisions for petitions with signatures to trigger a rethink. Maria believes 2,000 signatures in a petition could encourage state action, but she needs about $200 for costs like transport and advertising. This is equivalent to her monthly wage. She submits her case on the new ACT platform, and after a period of review by proposal curators, the ACT community is notified through the app. Support for Maria and Lena's problem is massive and global. Her cause is funded quickly with additional funds spurring further proposals both in Belarus and around the world. 2016 saw anti-coal movements globally, from the US, UK, and Germany, to Australia and Indonesia. As movements such as these grow, 
the related financial burden tends to fall on local communities. Through ACT, financial support can be mobilized quickly, only limited by the generosity and commitment of citizens globally. Millions of euros or dollars could be deployed for game-changing civic action in a matter of hours with all funding decisions made by citizens themselves. Utilizing the power of blockchain technology, individuals all over the world can unify in powerful new ways to ensure social accountability and build the future we want for ourselves and our children. This is possible. Welcome to ACT, Citizens First. So exciting, no? Um, really, um, what's impactful and what's uh, especially for me was interesting to learn is that when Fraser Brown, who is the individual um, driving this uh, initiative, first reached out to me last year to get an estimate like what it would take to build this thing, uh, we talked for a few hours about initially how could blockchain technology impact um, climate change and uh, support uh, sustainability. But uh, as um, he was working with his team on uh, formulating the vision, it went way beyond on creating something very generic where we as individuals, no matter where we are, can support someone else on the other corner of the world uh, and make a difference in their life and their community's life. Uh, what makes me believe that it has a future is um, uh, the fact that um, there is new generation of globalists uh, about to take rain from millennials. And uh, when I see my friend's daughter, who is five years old, uh, coming with a piggy bank and saying, I saw on TV uh, that girls in Afghanistan don't have access to education and they ha don't have even basic means and I want to contribute this money that I've been saving uh, to them, like mom can you help me? This makes me believe that this type of model is workable. And ACT particularly is uh, basing their theory like on the theory of, cha uh, of change and uh, they look into mobilizing of citizen support in alignment with uh, sustainable development goals uh, and uh, drives it to activities, um, mobilizing and putting together efforts of NGOs and civ uh, uh, civil society to drive to real impact. So with this example, taking a very global approach, I would like also to look at the potential uh, of the potential of also localized approach uh, also with another initiative. So EduDAO uh, has been designed to address the problem of educational institutions, schools, community colleges who um, do not necessarily have the necessary funding either for equipment that they need or for financing certain curriculum. The challenge also not only around not enough finance, but also uh, certain rigid procedures that uh, require institutions, um, educational institutions to spend money certain way. So what they came up with is this uh, low cost, and by low cost it means that it's one twentieth of a fee of, of donors choose and one tenth of a Kickstarter. So it's a really analog to make it um, affordable and um, it's highly transparent, like fully traceable, blockchain-based, and auditable uh, funding platform. So they are already, as one of their funding proposals, they are working with the Quality Charter School in Bronx in New York, and they discovered that um, they would like to have more uh, adult courses to help adults to break uh, and pivot their careers into tech. So they are looking to fundraise and uh, to bring that to reality in their community, to enable community to grow, to bloom, to create, um, well, to create breadwinning um, opportunities uh, for uh, that local community and um, as a result to like pay more taxes and um, support locally. Um, 
their families. Uh, they also have uh, been engaged uh, into numerous, into running numerous hackathons um, together with Startup Weekend, uh, and also working on um, social activities like mocking your first interview with technology company and so on. So Eugene Leventhal is behind this project. Uh, there's also, like on all pages I include Twitter handles, so you can easily find, you can easily connect, or if you don't find and you want to engage with some project, reach out to me, um, I'll be happy to connect you. So coming next, so I talked about like different types of crowdfunding and impact, and I would like to touch on the topic of digital identity next. And uh, what is the problem around digital identity that requires solving? Uh, so I don't know how familiar you are with the topic, uh, but uh, according to different calculations, there is 1.2 and some say 1.5 billion people who do not have any type of um, government identity. No birth certificates, um, no uh, driver's licenses, well, pretty much nothing to prove who they are. And um, the price that comes, uh, that these individuals pay is that pretty much every sixth person is not participating in um, economy. Uh, they do not have access to government services. They do not have access to healthcare, uh, to possibility to open bank account, travel, like all the standard challenges. And what's even more worrying is that very often, like there's 60 million refugees, uh, or displaced individuals. And uh, what's worrying is that many of them are women who are vulnerable to trafficking, like women and men uh, vulnerable to forced labor. So um, one of the initiatives in the space that um, uh, wanted to tackle this, um, in addition, like jointly, uh, with a number of industry leaders is uh, ID2020. Um, the goal there was to create a digital identity um, that would be like personal, persistent, private, and portable. Um, aside from ID2020, there's like also recently announced uh, Decentralized Identity Foundation, uh, which is also a consortia of large players um, like Microsoft, uh, Accenture, a bunch of startups that are working also jointly with um, United Nations to create a solution for this problem. The goal is to define the technological solution by 2020 and to have all, all individuals with access to digital, portable digital identity by 2030. Um, I would also like to highlight uh, Hyperledger project uh, Indie that was recently contributed, open sourced um, to Linux Foundation's Hyperledger uh, by Sorin Foundation. Uh, we are proud member, one of the founding members of Hyperledger and it grew from 30 initial members to over 140 organizations, institutions, banks, uh, startups who are behind this. Uh, but also uh, the goal is to involve uh, the research community, the developer community to contribute to this open source initiative. Anyone can take it and um, go forward with it and build an application on top. Um, there is identity working group and there's a link, so please join. There's ongoing calls, there's ongoing um, collaboration uh, between members and you do not necessarily have to be a member of Hyperledger to participate as well as to leverage um, identity projects that's uh, run by Hyperledger. And um, Brian Bellendorf is here for uh, the lunch keynote um, who will be also diving deeper into all the different Hyperledger projects, but that's the ones that I wanted to highlight. And uh, another initiative in the space is Uport. So I um, saw on the agenda there is also a uh, representative from Consensus Systems who potentially could highlight this in more detail. And uh, Consensus uh, has been driving this project already also for a while. And the idea is of connecting and putting individual um, in the center of um, 
of their own data and um, connecting to a variety of applications, either from the blockchain world or just regular applications. There is also going to be an ID 2020 summit in New York on June 19th. So there is a link to register if you happen to be in New York or if you would be interested to attend. So that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to highlight on the um, identity topic. Um, I also want to put a disclaimer that it's very dynamic and moving space. So I, at no, uh, for no, at no, there's no reason for me to assume that I have shared with you absolutely everything. And also, um, please be mindful that uh, there is a bunch of initiative going on in um, in this space, just like in all the other blockchain, uh, particular blockchain applications. Uh, the next topic that I would like to bring you to is transparency of supply chains and how that could have social impact for our day-to-day -day lives and how provenance of where the uh, products and services that we consume, um, like how that impacts us. And uh, the project that first comes to mind that was very well covered is IBM's project with um, pork uh, and making pork safe in China. So what IBM did together with Walmart is, uh, first of all, took the certificates and results of lab analysis and put it on the blockchain to be able to trace and track um, the pork from slaughterhouse to the shelves in the supermarket and um, potentially prevent the bad and spoiled pro uh, meat to get on the shelves in the first place. But if it happens that anyone would ever get a food poisoning, it would be very easy leveraging blockchain technology to trace back um, exactly to um, the company supplier uh, that was uh, providing that. Uh, next project uh, that I would like to talk about is coming from London. It's uh, Project Provenance. Uh, Provenance HQ is their Twitter handle, uh, run by uh, Jessie Baker and her team uh, out of London. And they initially looked at how we could make uh, fishing, and particularly tuna fishing and distribution, more sustainable process and safer process both uh, from very different aspects, from aspects of, um, again, tracing uh, supply chain and tracing provenance of the fish, uh, ensuring that um, it's been fished in a sustainable way and that there was no forced labor involved. And since uh, the tuna project, the initial fish project, they have gone to different domains like into fashion, ensuring and the way their platform works and um, I hope you can see it so there's a mobile application where brand owners can join to that mobile app and build relationship of trust with their consumers to demonstrate exactly where like all the threads for the fabrics that apparel um, is like is made of and where it comes from. Um, so visit project uh, provenance.org to discover the unique journey behind this product is um, what they print on all the tags for uh, um, for, for the uh, brand vendors uh, that they're working with. And uh, speaking of social impact, um, again, so as I mentioned, so there is way, be, way more to just for us as consumers um, to understand not only about where particular, um, particular goods or services are coming from, but also who's made it and in which conditions they were kept, whether it was um, voluntary choice for them to work on this um, at this factory or whether it's forced labor or whether, you know, I really hope that with this type of solutions we can eliminate child labor and we can eliminate uh, some of the unhuman practices that are still happening today. Um, another very quite known um, and interesting project uh, leads us to uh, diamonds industry and um, some of you might have seen even the Blood Diamonds movie, uh, but um, Everledger and IBM have uh, joined forces to uh, bring transparency to this industry. And um, I had the opportunity to see the live demo of this solution uh, 
at IBM Interconnect in March in Vegas, where Lee and Camp of Everledger, um, together with uh, IBM's uh, researcher, Donna Dellenberger, have demonstrated it live. And uh, they were able to capture uh, really millions of dollars worth of diamonds that were not compliant to Kimberly process uh, in terms of certificates. So it does not necessarily mean that those diamonds come from conflict zones, but it definitely forces the industry to become more transparent. All right. Um, last but not least is um, my own company, that um, Intellect EU. Um, we have worked uh, for the last three years to build applications leveraging blockchain technology and our goal was that given our 10 years of experience in the integration space was to imagine the world where blockchains would be interoperable as well uh, not only between themselves but also with the existing systems of records uh, with existing systems uh, because uh, we cannot imagine that blockchain applications would be um, would be isolated. There is always a uh, need to interoperate with uh, existing back office infrastructures if we talk about financial industry or like for any project, be it identity or supply chain, you need to operate with all those endpoints that collect data and that store data and transfer it within organizations uh, and business networks. And um, that's pretty much all I wanted to share uh, today. There is definitely a multitude of applications in other industries and sectors uh, that I have not touched upon. Um, so I was also very excited to see uh, there is AgriLedger today, so I'm looking forward to hear uh, more and to learn as well about applications on um, land title management. There is applications in voting and healthcare that are upcoming. There is still a, forming, uh, a process of forming solutions around it. So I would like to open floor to questions, if any, and please connect in all meaningful ways if you would like to get involved in any of the projects. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I don't know if we have anyone who has written out questions or um, we have no cards going around, but in the meantime, if you can just raise your hand, then um, we'll go here and then. Hey, um, Alex, I'm the consensus guy. Sorry. Um, I was wondering what the biggest challenge you faced um, with integration has been. Like, what's been the biggest difficulty in getting people on board for this stuff? When it comes to integration, first of all, uh, the projects have to be live, right? So there's still very little number of projects in blockchain space. It's still very early days. So the key is that uh, integration is a moving target in terms of APIs changing, technology changing. It's still, we're not yet mature there. Uh, we are, uh, we see a lot of value with uh, the fact that we have understanding of all the existing um, systems and infrastructure so we can come and make that vision and potentially help to drive to the standards like in financial world if there is ISO 20 or 22 why would you invent something else uh, and you could really leverage what's already in existence to make blockchain adoption for the use cases where it makes sense much faster and um, I, um, I don't think I mentioned it but also as part of this um, talk I wanted to mention um, the work that Consensus is doing in the field of blockchain for social impact. So there is a link down there, so, and um, I hope you will be also covering that in more detail. Um, really appreciate that initiative. So that just to Given that I'm an engineer and not a computer scientist, could you explain what a blockchain is? And in particular, what's special about it in that the applications you presented can be done today without blockchains? This is a great question that's, you know, and we can get in a long discussion of what blockchain is and what distributed ledger and what the 
uh, limitations are of uh, all the applications. So for me, blockchain technology is an application where we can ensure timestamps and trust in environments where before you would not um, have or need that trust, right? And um, uh, really, um, uh, so just uh, from, from your question on uh, what exactly you would build, maybe someone in the audience would like to take that question because, um, Would someone else want to add to that? <laughs> I'm sure we'll have a rich discussion unless there's a quick, uh, quick answer. And if no one else wants to, um, yeah. So it's just a way to to replicate um, an ongoing chain of of like records that are hashed together in chronological order and an incentive structure for getting people to hold those records. So that's why you have the cryptocurrency. Um, it's not only the application, but it's also kind of a byproduct of like what gets people wanting to actually support this system. So it's like an in internal way to, to get people to help you validate things that have been submitted within the network. I, I like to, to, to take the question that uh, the colleague asked, but not to, to give an answer. I think that what is missing is the link between the blockchain technology and the applications that you described. So one should understand better why blockchain enables that, those applications and mm -hmm. why those applications weren't possible before blockchain. Got it. This is really the key, in my opinion. So almost every use case you'll hear today, uh, inevitably you'd be able to come back and say, well, couldn't you just run that as a central database? And the answer is always yes. It'll always be faster and cheaper and more flexible. You'll be able to move it faster. But the question is who? Who gets to run that central database? And in almost every use case, the reason why people are looking at using blockchain tech is because the cost of having to trust that central party is too high, or it's higher than it should be, or higher than it needs to be, right? So in the case of a currency, for example, having one bank or one institution be the final authority for everybody's accounts wouldn't really work with, if you really want trust and decentralization, right? But in identity, for example, like you look at what India is doing with the digital identity systems, the ADAR, there's some upside for sure, but there's a lot of deep privacy concerns and centralization of control concerns. And so in every use case, think decentralization. Think not needing a hub in the middle of a hub and spoke network, but more of a peer-to-peer -peer network. Yes, um, thank you. Okay, trust but verify is a very old saying, and you brought that up. My question is, I have yet to see a system where no matter how hard you try, you can't keep the bad actors with their sticky little fingers and their greedy little eyes out of it. So what considerations are going around for making darn sure that it's going to be as close to impossible as, as is humanly capable of being achieved? Because they will try. And inevitably, as history shows, some of them have succeeded. What are you doing to keep the bad guys at bay? Well, it's, it's a very, very great, like very big question, very big consideration, and uh, definitely consensus was uh, the element uh, that blockchain brings to the table that wasn't available before to ensure that um, it's not n like no one, n not an individual, not an organization is in power and in control to make the change or to tamper the data, so everybody has control, but no one in control. And um, I don't know, maybe someone else would like to add to that. If it's open and auditable, you've got a shot at this. 
Oh, well, and there, for example, at Hyperledger and Hyperledger Fabric um, in particular, there is uh, channels in place and there is additional efforts on uh, to actually take and demonstrate and share only the data at the uh, need to know basis. Like you can store hashes, you can, so there's a debate of what you keep on chain and what you keep off chain. But the goal is uh, in order to comply, for example, with GP, uh, GDPR regulation in Europe, you really need to make sure that some of the data, for example, doesn't leave the uh, EU. And if we build global networks, we need to ensure how to um, store the data properly and share the data properly. And uh, what's also very important to me uh, personally, like with potential rise of quantum computing, right, uh, with crypto, uh, crypto apocalypses potentially coming, how to ensure that, all right, uh, some of the data never becomes public. And uh, it's, it's really a very thin line, and probably there is, um, I don't know, Brian potentially could speak to that as well. Um, sorry for picking on you, Brian, but I know you're very passionate uh, for that topic of surveillance and bad actors. Well, in, in just generalizing a bit. So the data that is public and publicly shared is publicly auditable, right? There's other levels of public, though. There could be public in the form of you know, people who are members of a consortium or people who are members of uh, other types of governance models that we have. And so the question might be, those members of that consortium, how do they trust in the integrity of the transactions between those members, right? Uh, and, and think of this like a spectrum. And there's some data you don't want shared. I mean, personal health data, you don't even want quantum computers in 20 years to be able to inadvertently reveal. So in every one of these deployments, there will be a tough conversation amongst the stakeholders in these environments between what data do we audit and share publicly? And it might just be signatures and hashes of that data so that we can prove in the future that some transaction happened. Uh, but it might be you know, things that, that we do want publicly and very, very much shared, right? So public or private, these are going to be use case specific, situation specific. Hey, uh, myself, Jay Krishnan from Bob Labs. Uh, my question is, why Hyperledger? Why not Ethereum in all of those things? Oh, uh, the first uh, couple of examples were um, Ethereum-based. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, Ethereum also, um, I don't know, you might be aware of Monax, uh, who has contributed borrow uh, code also to Hyperledger. So Hyperledger is designed um, from the government standpoint, governance standpoint, as an umbrella organization to host a number of um, code bases. And uh, for example, consensus here, sorry mm -hmm. for picking on you, but um, consensus is uh, pretty much focused on Ethereum development, but they're also members of Hyperledger. So in a way, it's a very flexible and very open um, structure with a good governance. And from technology standpoint, we welcome and Ethereum and Hyperledger Fabric, Hyperledger Indy, so there is um, absolutely. Um, for us as an integrator, it actually doesn't matter. We, mm -hmm. we are seeing uh, the future in the world uh, of having multiple blockchain, multiple technologies. The key there is to find the common standard. And that's a big topic of whether we are ready to go and to work on that standard yet, right? And just to ensure that all the communities do not go into many different uh, streams and like it will become uh, hardly possible to interpret in an easy and efficient way. Thank you. Other questions? Anyone from this side? <laughs> <laughs> that side's been pretty heavy. In Providence, when you want to certify that a tuna was caught the right way or a product was made the right way, I understand you can trust within the blockchain, but how can you prevent a counterfeit, somebody substituting a blood diamond or a, an illegally caught tuna? Absolutely great question. And uh, the true answer, you can't. If you put the junk you know, in the system, you, you can. So what Provenance HQ is doing, they have uh, feet on the ground inspectors from the company who are working with local suppliers and who are verifying that. Uh, but of course, we are operating under assumptions that the data that is fed uh, from all the players um, is uh, accurate. 
and uh, of course, again, using consensus, you can afterwards, like if in, in document management, right, you can afterwards prove that certain document has, uh, um, has not been tampered or changed, but you cannot, for, from the physical goods perspective, there is limited amount of uh, effort that you can put uh, to ensure that indeed, uh, you know, you can verify certificates, but uh, and you can engrave the codes on the diamond, uh, but um, eventually uh, you still have to work with those organizations or, uh, as Providence is doing, just put their, your own inspectors. So it, it is a challenge to be addressed. I, I don't have the answer. I don't know, maybe someone else in the audience has the answer or who worked with organization or startup who tackled it in the physical world, but it is a challenge. Well, I have somewhat of a related question, um, but with the humans involved. Um, I love the ID2020 project, um, but I wonder if there's a gap between the technology that's necessary to implement this blockchain um, accountability and the people who are affected. You know, these refugees may not have the mobile phones or to have the technology that's necessary to execute on the promise of blockchain. I wonder if you had thoughts about that. Um, very, very valid question. And what's um, interesting and valuable is, for example, in Malawi, right? Uh, there is 90% uh, of children are vaccinated. So there is uh, individuals, for example, from Gavi who are traveling there, who actually working with those children, who put the needle in their vein. And at the same time, they could have taken those fingerprints and they could have taken that data to ensure and to know to whom they've done the vaccine. So at this point in Malawi, there is only 2% people who have identity, who have any type of government ID, whereas 4% are on Facebook and 90% are vaccinated. So the idea here is not necessarily imagine the world where everybody would have a mobile phone or a tablet to keep their digital identity. and to, So there's two different aspects to it for us as individuals with many accounts, as Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, and so on, and then the developing world. Uh, like, but really, uh, like us coming and uh, supporting uh, the developing countries, uh, there is a possibility, like an example of vaccination, to bring those people uh, on and to ensure that those kids do not get vaccinated twice, for example. I have a follow-up question, actually. I have the mic. Um, so the UNHCR is collecting digital identities for refugees in a collaboration with Accenture, um, and they're doing this through biometric data collection. Um, I'm sort of concerned about the risks that this presents to refugees who may be fleeing their countries, and now they're permanently tethered to a record, right? So um, they will always have their eyes, their fingertips, um, likely their facial structure will stay the same. So how do these platforms actually put these communities at risk? It's a very big topic, and that's to earlier discussion about the evil, right, and bad actors potentially, um, potentially uh, getting hold of the data, and this is us in a collaboration as a community uh, making sure that when we build those applications, there's no chance for those bad actors to uh, play a role and get hold of the data or potentially with the right to be forgotten, for example, in Europe, like ensuring that someone will not be refused a job because they've been in a refugee camp, right? So that's a very valid concern. There's a, a very Promethean kind of layer to this, right? Which is the sense that if it's deployed wrong, it ends up creating more problems for us, but to some degree, you can't necessarily prevent the bad actions or bad actors. Um, and there are many folks, both uh, agencies operating in these uh, environments, as well as people in these environments themselves, who say, you know, you shouldn't let the, the, the perfect be the enemy of the good, and that there is tremendous good that can be created, even if you are creating a centralized registry of everybody's thumbprint and the um, immunizations they've received, right? Tying it to immunizations, perhaps pretty benign, and tying it to you know the speech that the speeches that they make or the political opinions they hold, obviously that would be wrong, right? So again, there's a questions of nuance and 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 spectra here. Um, uh, but uh, I I I I would love to see if we were start starting to deploy these for health records, for example, or or for voting reg registrations or for other things that we do think deeply about how to make sure the first major deployments are as privacy protecting and privacy enhancing 
uh, as we can, at least in those environments that can support that level of technical sophistication. One last question. Hey, good morning, Hannah. Uh, I have one question, and I don't know a lot about blockchain, but I was wondering, how do you feel about people that say that blockchain is just a hype? Because I've been talking to startups that were founders that have told me, like, blockchain is just a hype. It's, it's not going to be as big as some people might say it is. How do you feel about that? Well, uh, it depends on what is meant by hype. Because uh, in all ways, technology goes through the curve uh, of adoption. And definitely, there is, uh, it's, it's not a universal pill that will cure all the uh, human illnesses. And um, the goal of my uh, presentation today was to walk you through the initiatives where individuals are not just talking about the hype and what it could do, but actually doing something and open up for everybody here to potentially engage with those founders and those uh, leaders and uh, collaborate in that aspect, like on the real projects to bring it from hype to reality. But we are very early days, so I, I'm not here to also say that we have solved any of these grand challenges with blockchain today, and it's not going to go take tomorrow, it will take several years, at least. Thank you for the question. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe one last question. Uh, good morning. Um, First of all, I'd like to say I'm not a naysayer in any way, and I don't, uh, I'm just really interested in your perspective on this question. Um, I think we all see that we're just scratching the surface in terms of uses of blockchain and the technology to use this core technology. But um, is the core technology itself in any sort of evolution, or is it this monolithic technology just here today, um, and that's what it is? Because if that's the case, it's a bit strange for observers of technology how things usually evolve it's so dynamic you can't even imagine so uh, really every day you get certain sort of announcement of someone starting either a new chain or a new flavor of blockchain technology like uh, hyperledger itself has uh, been uh, formed only in february last year um, Ethereum um, has been around since uh, 2015, so it's very dynamically changing. Like uh, I mentioned, uh, the Centralized Identity Foundation that's been just recently announced. So it's it's really very dynamically changing, both on technological uh, stack and uh, implementation stack, and the players who are getting involved, and more and more individuals and organizations are. Uh, getting and joining. So I believe that as we will have that uh, critical mass of um, researchers, scientists, uh, industry leaders putting their efforts together, then we get a chance to come with a mature product uh, based on the technology uh, that can make a difference. At this point, it's a very, very dynamic space. And uh, that's to an earlier question about challenges of integration. Uh, very difficult to integrate a moving target where it evolves um, and every month. Like Hyperledger Fabric is now migrating to 1.0 and it's uh, a new, like totally different architecture compared to 0 0.6 version. So a lot of moving points. Right, are you speaking about the core technology of blockchain? Or are you talking about the, uh, the people? I'm talking about the, different the, the, flavors the, of blockchain technology. So there's... Uh, the actual technology, and then people can build applications. Uh, startups can build applications, and very often they start with one technology. Like uh, initially, I saw uh, when I was judging on startup competitions, uh, probably a year ago and two years ago, many were just taking a fork of Bitcoin blockchain and building out of that. And then they saw some evolution of Ethereum or like Hyperledger Fabric and they started to migrate their solutions to something that's more uh, industry ready. And it, it's really an evolving process. I, I don't know if I answered your question or whether that makes sense, my answer makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the, the core technologies. I hear everyone speaking about use it, you know, building applications on the, the, the blockchain um, uh, technology itself. So I was wondering whether the core technology could change and we're building these things which 
and there will be an evolution of the core technology itself. I think there is, uh, Iana wants to take this one. Yes, so one thing that's important to clarify is that there is really no one notion of the core blockchain technology. The very first implementation and the evolution of the Bitcoin blockchain back in 2008-2009 spawned the use of the term. But since the Bitcoin blockchain was only designed for one thing and one thing only, which was how does one person on one part of the world send value to another person in the other part of the world without an intermediary has a very limited scope of what it was designed for and what it's good for. But it opened up Pandora's box of other people saying, wait a second, this technology seems like it's really interesting. I wonder if we could use this underlying concept of a distributed ledger and no intermediaries for other reasons beyond just Bitcoin and transfer value. So that's what gave rise to the Ethereums of the world, the Hyperledger Foundation, which is sponsoring a number of projects uh, within that umbrella, other derivatives platforms you mentioned, Monax and Tendermint and a couple of others as well. And so you end up with these variations of the core protocol layer. And then on top of the core protocol layers, you end up with different use cases. Some use cases are being built by companies. Some uh, use cases are, are being built by startups that are looking to disrupt the incumbents. Other use cases are being built by consortiums, which are essentially just a fancy term for a group of companies that get together to achieve a common objective. So from that perspective, when you think about a use case and then you start deconstructing all the technical components, you almost have a menu of options at your disposal rather than just one kind of core technology. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.